So I'm going to talk about spooky botnets, and they are spooky. Uh, so going to the next, there you go. So if you haven't met me yet, I'm Steven. I am a third year CS major. I am the webmaster for White Hat, and I am a fan of the Windows 10 blue screen. Uh, this is pretty much what I use as my Zoom background in classes. So it's a nice screenshot of me. Uh, OK. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of a story. And since it's Halloween and spooky season, uh, you can just imagine that we're all gathered around a campfire and telling a spooky story. Uh, or maybe you don't have to imagine the fire part if you're in SoCal, or if you just imagine the metaphorical fires uh, of just the state of the world we're in. Or you could use uh, this outage map from Down Detector as your fire. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a map of the outage from October 2016. Uh, when Dyn DNS went down. Uh, and this was a very large uh, distributed denial of service attack uh, or a DDoS attack uh, that affected Dyn DNS. Uh, if you don't know what DNS is, if you weren't here for John's talk on that a couple of weeks ago, DNS is basically how your computer uh, knows where to go on the internet. If you type in something like calpoly.edu, uh, it'll go out and try to find what IP address that is so it can connect to that server and get you to the right web page. So if you can't use DNS, a lot of the internet breaks. And that's what happens uh, in October of 2016 when DynDNS went down. Uh, they hosted the DNS for a lot of major services like GitHub, Amazon, Spotify, Netflix, Reddit, the New York Times, a lot of big name uh, sort of websites. So was, uh, people noticed this uh, and it was down for quite a while. Uh, at the time it was the largest DDoS attack in history, I believe. It was somewhere around, if I remember correctly, one terabyte of network traffic per second, uh, which is a thousand gigabits per second, uh, whereas just a normal like large DDoS attack is typically only around ten gigabits per second. So this is just huge, huge amounts of traffic all being directed to these Dyn servers, uh, causing them to be overwhelmed and not being able to process legitimate requests. Uh, and so as uh, the researchers dug into this, they found that it was uh, being perpetrated by uh, this botnet that was called Mirai. And a couple of weeks prior, uh, the source code for Mirai was leaked online in some hacking forums, uh, probably as uh, a way to uh, kind of hide who was actually behind writing the source code, because uh, if you leak it and a bunch of people start using it, it's hard to sort of pin it on the original author. Uh, so no one really knows who is behind the attack on Dyne. Uh, but a month prior, uh, in September of 2016, there was a previous very large DDoS attack on uh, the Krebs on Security blog. Uh, so the blogger Brian Krebs had written an article, uh, I believe, about the botnet uh, or something like that. And then his website was hit with a DDoS attack, uh, and his provider wasn't able to uh, keep his protected site from that because, again, it was just massive amounts of traffic larger than they'd seen before. Uh, and so everyone was trying to figure out who was behind this, where did this Mirai botnet come from. Uh, and a lot of the, uh, the guesses and 
at the time was from some sort of nation state actor. Uh, so somewhere like uh, Russia, China, North Korea, somewhere with a lot of resources, um, a lot of skilled hackers, a lot of power uh, behind them to just generate all of this malicious traffic and infect so many of these devices to cause that sort of outage. Uh, and that was the prevailing theory for a while uh, until uh, the law enforcement and researchers did actually find the original authors of Mirai, and they turned out to be uh, one of the common threat actors of just bored college students. Uh, so they had written this botnet to take down competing Minecraft servers uh, because apparently Minecraft is pretty popular and you can make money off of running servers. And if you can take out the competition and get more people to come to your servers, you make more money. And then if you start DDoSing these other servers, taking them down all the time, you can get them to buy DDoS protection and make more money that way. Uh, and they also ended up doing this uh, to their school records, uh, just DDoSing them around uh, like midterms or registration time uh, and just causing a trouble for them and then push them to uh, buy some more DDoS protection and we're just making money off of it that way. Uh, eventually they also did uh, like I said, they released the source code on hacking forums and they would rent out the botnet for hire so you could uh, just pay them a price and get access to the botnet for a couple hours, go do whatever you wanted with it. Uh, and that's a business model for botnets as well. Uh, so how did this happen? Uh, and botnets rely on having a lot of infected machines to go out and do their bidding. Uh, that's the sort of model uh, for the attacks that they're going for. Uh, and with Mira in particular, uh, you might think that they did something really fancy uh, to get into all of these different devices, I think. The number it was like 30,000 different devices. Uh, so how did they get control of so many computers? Well, here on the screen is uh, a screenshot from part of the code from Mirai. And this is a list of uh, just different usernames and passwords that it was guessing. So we have like root admin, admin, admin root one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, admin with no password, you know, uh, admin one, 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 one. Uh, and these are all seem like horrible, horrible username and password combinations. Like these are not very secure. Uh, and that's the problem is that a lot of these devices actually had these passwords. So this worked to gain access to a lot of different things. Uh, and the reason for that is it specifically targeted uh, IoT devices or Internet of Things, uh, which are, for the most part, little gadgets that are connected to the Internet. Uh, they're not very powerful. There are things like uh, maybe your Amazon Echo or your smart TV. Uh, or like a internet webcam or something like that. Uh, something that you just throw on your network and it works and you forget about it and don't go back to it. And they have these default passwords. Uh, and as you can see uh, from this example, that is not a good thing to do. They're vulnerable to uh, being guessed and then uh, once you guess the password for an admin account on these devices, you have pretty much full control over it. 
Yeah, this is kind of what I just talked about. So it was targeting IoT devices, things like cameras, smart TVs, radios, printers, routers, uh, vehicles, you know, DVRs, thermostats, stadium monitors, anything that's on the internet, basically. Uh, and many of these have uh, just default passwords or weak security in general and can just easily be uh, taken over by the spot net. So, you know, you have your camera, your TV, your printer, uh, your toaster, your baby monitor, and now they're all zombies. Uh, so I've been talking about botnets this whole time, but now I'm, you should uh, just define and explain sort of what is a botnet. Um, so the definition from Cloudflare on the what a botnet is, is that it's a network of infected devices under hidden control of a third party. Uh, and these infected clients are known as bots or as zombies. Uh, and bots is where botnet gets its name from. It's a bot network. Uh, and these are usually connected back to a command and control server uh, known as a CNC or C2 server. Uh, and that'll be sending out the commands to these infected machines and telling them what to do. Uh, so uh, in this model that we have on the, the picture on the slide, is uh, a centralized CNC server and all the bots will connect back to it to get their commands. Uh, often a lot of the more recent botnets won't use this model because all you have to do to make the botnet useless is take down the CNC server, then they're not getting commands anymore and everyone's safe. Uh, so there are other uh, models described in more detail uh, when I was doing the research on Cloudflare site. So they're uh, like tiered models where you have uh, one CNC at the top and that'll give commands to a couple other servers and then servers below that. And then the boss will get their commands just in this chain going up. So even if you take out a few of the servers, there's still sort of a chain of commands that's left. And um, there's also a peer-to-peer -peer botnet model where each infected device uh, acts as a bot or a zombie and will receive commands from other devices, but then it itself acts as a C2 server for other devices in the network. So it'll get commands from somewhere and then relay those commands to the other bots under its control. And those are a lot harder to take down. So, I mean, once you have all of these infected devices, what are you gonna do with them? What is the purpose of having a botnet at all? Um, other than having thousands of little computers ready to do your bidding. Uh, well, uh, I met a security researcher on a train uh, with my high school on our way to our competition. And he was talking with us and he told us that in his experience that he's seen three reasons for uh, any cyber attack in general. Uh, the first being revenge, uh, and this could take the form of, you know, maybe an employee was fired from their company and they want to get back, or, uh, you know, someone posted something on their blog that you don't like, so you go take it down, uh, things like that. So with a botnet, we've seen you can uh, pull off these massive DDoS attacks and basically knock uh, any server offline with the amount of traffic that you're sending to it uh, if they don't have good enough protection. Uh, so that's a possibility. Uh, another one uh, extremely common among botnets is for money. Uh, so in addition to just DDoSing someone, you could also say, hey, I see you're getting DDoS a lot. How about I sell you this protection that I also happen to have, uh, and you can gain money off of that. Uh, or what a lot of botnets will do will either be sending spam messages, uh, 
and just making money that way or committing uh, advertising fraud and just going around, clicking on uh, all the ads everywhere. And then suddenly those advertisers have to pay a lot of money because their ads are driving lots of traffic. Uh, and the third uh, is fame amongst peers uh, or just like proving that you can do something. Uh, you know, that's where like developing a hack and then posting it on the hacker forums or the dark web and saying like, hey, look at this cool hack that I did. It breaks everything. Like, this is awesome. Uh, so that's a possibility as well. And uh, as you can see from our uh, learn by doing perspective, there was a Cal Poly student in 2012 who ran a botnet and rented out his software to pay for college. So, I mean, you, you can pay for college. Uh, but let me, let me say, don't do this. This is not a good thing to learn by doing. Uh, he did avoid jail time, but that's not a reason to go out and do this. I'm sure there are still consequences. Do not listen to me. I'm not a lawyer. Don't do this. Uh, so why are botnets so prevalent and why are they hard to control? Uh, for the most part, it comes down to IoT devices. Uh, these are uh, just very cheap uh, and massively produced products that uh, end up you know, everywhere. So it's uh, your coffee maker, your refrigerator, uh, your toaster, uh, thermostat, like all these little devices that just connect to the internet. Uh, most of the time they'll be cheap and they're cheap because the manufacturers do not support them. Uh, and so if they're cheap and unsupported, there's no incentive for security really. So they're probably never gonna get patched or updated. They might come with a default username and password that can be easily guessed. Uh, and just the sheer number of them out on the internet uh, makes them a target for botnets. And odds are, if there's something like this coffee maker here, it'll be hacked and made part of a botnet and just doing malicious stuff. Uh, so that's why botnets are so prevalent and just hard to get rid of. Uh, so the ways that you can protect against your IoT devices becoming enslaved to a botnet is if there's one piece of advice in security that you can always give is to change your default passwords. Do not leave anything uh, that it comes with out of the box. You should change it, especially if it's something really weak like admin admin uh, or just like no password at all. Uh, and make sure those passwords are secure and not easily guessable. Uh, that'll prevent a lot uh, a lot of hacks. For the most part, the botnets are just scanning the internet for uh, these insecure IoT devices with default passwords, going through the list and guessing all those combinations. And then if it doesn't uh, catch anything, they're most likely not gonna do anything more complicated to try and hack your device. They'll just move on to something that's an easier target. Uh, another thing that you can do if you think that your device has been compromised by a botnet is you can uh, shut it off and wipe the memory and restore it. Uh, but this will only work if the, the infection isn't persistent and it uh, goes away once you turn it off. Uh, and you know this isn't the best protection because if it got already got hacked once, Odds are when you go and put it back on the internet, it'll be scanned and hacked again uh, if you haven't done anything else to protect it. So 
it's a temporary solution at best. Uh, it'll get the botnet out of your device uh, if that's what you're going for, but you have to do a little bit more to actually keep it from being hacked in the first place. Uh, another important thing you can do with your IoT devices is to make sure you have good firewall rules and to isolate it from the rest of your network. Because uh, if something, an infection gets into your IoT device, it's going to start scanning your network next, probably, for other vulnerable devices. So if it's isolated from your other machines, it won't be able to infect them. And then if you have good firewall rules, you can make sure that it is only connecting to the places and ports that it is supposed to be connecting to. And you can make sure it's not doing any weird stuff. Uh, and you should also update your devices if at all possible. Make sure that they are patched and more secure. Uh, but if they have weak passwords, that's not going to do you much good. So change your passwords. Change, change, change your passwords. <laughs> that is the number one advice for security. All right. That is most of my talk. Any questions? Uh, if you know off the top of your head, how do you typically change the default passwords on like Internet of Things devices or IoT devices? Um, that is a good question. And I don't know. I think it will be different for every device. So you'll have to have to look for the manufacturer's directions on their website. Uh, if it's really bad, you won't be able to change it. And, you know, that's, that's a problem. Uh, that's the manufacturer's fault. Uh, but that's definitely a possibility. Because uh, a lot of these things are just kind of slapped together, thrown on the market uh, with no real thought for security at all. So, uh, yeah, you just have to have to research and find out for your specific device.